So this this battle between principalities and powers, between good and evil, then would you say that people are just being a vessel, either for the dark or for the light? Or for the light, yeah. We become we become easy targets of whichever one we choose. So that's a great quote because for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of this world, against spiritual a, wickedness in high places. Yes, because every choice that we make to do the right thing or to not do the right thing, to serve good or serve evil, is making a choice that will determine what inhabits us, whether it be the principalities of good or evil when the battle comes. And, you know, we see how these battles started in a much more benign fashion, and now they're getting much more potent. Yeah, they sure are. And then God will spit out the lukewarm, those yep. who are sitting on the fence, so to speak. Right, because the people who are lukewarm are easy bait. They, they just go easily to the dark side because they don't have discernment. You know, they don't care, basically. You know, they don't care one way or another. So, okay. you know, you have to kind of care about good, you know, serving the good and, and making decisions that are in alignment with the moral law of God to actually then serve him. And then you have to make those choices even when it's inconvenient and or when it's hard. So anyway, yes, it's a very good quote because that's exactly what we are talking about is who are these principalities and powers? And right now the ones of good, the principalities and powers of good. And that's the angels. And we'll start with the hierarchy of angels according to St. Dionysius, the Areopagite, which is kind of the traditionally recognized angelology of most Christianity, Catholicism for sure, but most Christian religions accept his angelology as the authority and so i was going to read this one thing that he wrote which kind of gives an overview of one of the things that he says about the angels in an overview kind of fashion because there's so much that he does talk about so he says there there remains for our reverent contemplation a division which completes the angelic hierarchies that divided into god-like principalities and that, that's important god like why is it important we're going to explain that in a second archangels and angels and i think it necessary to declare first the meaning of their sacred appellations to the best of my ability and this is saint dionysius talking so why is that important god like principalities archangels and angels because lucifer was one of the archangels and he felt that he was just as good as God. He wanted to be like God. And that's what caused the fall. And that's why Lucifer is now Satan. And so it's important to understand that with Lucifer, he was a creation. He was not the creator. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the big important things in angelology and demonology to understand is that he was an angel uh, he was of a high order of archangels he was one of the archangels he thought he was like god but he was not like god he had godlike qualities just like a saint michael saint gabriel but only god as creator ha is is god being a creation automatically disqualifies you from being God. Mm -hmm. And we're all creatures. And it, ironically, in spiritual warfare, this is one of the things you can throw in his face when he comes to you, which is you are a creature. You'll never be a creator. You are not God. God will always be greater than you. And so that's why it's important to understand that. So these are God-like principalities, but they are God-like. And that's the archangels and angels. And so the order of the holy archangels is of the same rank with the heavenly principalities, for there is one hierarchy and division, as I said, of them and the angels. But since there's not a hierarchy which does not possess 
first and middle and last powers, the holy order of archangels occupies the middle position in the hierarchy between the extremes, for it belongs alike to the most holy principalities and to the holy angels, to the principalities because it is turned into a princely fashion to the super essential princedom and is molded to it as far as attainable and unites the angels after the fashion of its own well-regulated and marshaled and invisible leadings. And it belongs to the angels because it is of the messenger order, receiving hierarchically the divine illuminations from the first powers and denouncing the same to the angels in a godly manner and through angels manifesting to us in proportion to the religious aptitude of each of the godly persons illuminated for the angels as we have already said complete the whole series of heavenly minds as being the last order of the heavenly beings who possess the angelic characteristic yea rather they are more properly named angels by us than by those of higher degree because their hierarchy is occupied with the more manifest and is more particularly concerned with the things of the world. For the very highest order, as being placed in the first rank near the hidden one, we must consider as directing in spiritual things the second, hiddenly, and that the second, which is composed of the holy lordships and powers and authorities, leads the hierarchy of the principalities and archangels and angels more clearly indeed than the first hierarchy, but more hiddenly than the order after it and the revealing order of the principalities, archangels and angels presides through each other over the hierarchies amongst men in order that the elevation and conversion and communion and union with God may be in due order and further also that the procession from God vouchsafed benignly to all the hierarchies and passing to all in common may be also with most sacred regularity hence the word of god has assigned our heavenly hierarchy to angels by naming michael as ruler and so then there's the the order of the ophanim which are the angels of the throne the angels of the throne of god so they're very cool these particular hosts are the executive messengers of karmic law and sent forth by the chief justice of the tribunal in the fourth mansion. They are termed generals because they lead their hosts against nations and inhabitants of the world who violate the good law of right and justice. And then there's the Kaddishim, which is at the seat of judgment. And so the vision of the burning bush appeared to Moses alone. The other shepherds with him saw nothing of it. He took five steps in the direction of the bush to view it at close range. And when God beheld the countenance of Moses, distorted by grief and anxiety over Israel's suffering, he spake, this one is worthy of the office of pasturing my people. And so he became worthy of that office as being the pasturing, the pasture, pasture, well, the shepherd of the people, because he had that deep compassion and, and he was able to see the burning bush. And so, you know, what we see in the mystical spheres a lot is that what the soul who is worthy will see, will hear. Mm -hmm. And that is how many things are determined so because he saw he was proven worthy the others could not see and therefore that was a sign unto god that they were not vibrationally they were not compassionately they were not frequentially in a space where they had reached that holy level that was required for that office as moses had and this is goes to what we did and spoke about in the opening where we talked about people being vessels 
here on earth for dark and light. And this one is worthy of the office of pasturing my people. So he yes. was a worthy vessel. Yes. For that office. Yes. And so then the next one is the Merkaba. The Merkaba we hear about most frequently in the vision of Ezekiel. And so Ezekiel's image of Yahweh riding upon the chariot of the living creatures, accompanied by sights and voices, movements and upheavals in earth and heaven, lying outside the range of the deepest ecstatic experiences of all other Old Testament personages was for the Jewish mystic, a real opening, an unveiling of the innermost and impenetrable secrets locked up in the interrelation of the human and the divine. It was interpreted as a sort of divine self-opening, self-condescension to man. The door is flung wide open so that man at the direct invitation of God can come to the secret for which he longs and seeks. The chariot, also known as the Merkaba, was thus a kind of mystic way leading up to the final goal of the soul, or more precisely, it was the mystic instrument, the vehicle by which one was carried directly into the halls of the unseen. And so you see there's a path in Jewish mysticism called Merkaba mysticism. Mm -hmm. And you can see how this is why and how this led to it, but it's also part of Kabbalah. This is all part of that whole mystical tradition in Judaism. Then we have, we have the nine choirs of angels are classed in these different ways with the name of and chief of each, according to ancient legends. And so we have the cherubim and the chief of the cherubim is Jophiel. The dominions and the chief of the dominions is Zadkiel. We have the principalities and the chief of the principalities are Camiel. We have the seraphim and the chief of the seraphim is Uriel. And Uriel is one of the archangels. And then we have the virtues and the chief of the virtues is Haniel. We have the archangels and the chief of the archangels is Michael. We have the thrones that we talked about. And the chief of the thrones is Zaphkiel. We have the powers and the chief of the powers is Raphael, who's also one of the archangels. And so you see how their, their roles and their purposes can overlap mm -hmm. into different into different areas of the angelic hierarchy there. We also have St. Gabriel, another one of the archangels, ruling over just the general angels, the class of angels. And so we also, have, we also find that there are emblems which are borne by the angels. And some of the emblems that you'll see that are commonly seen by the angels are flaming swords, which are representative of the wrath of God, trumpets, which represent the voice of God, scepters, which represent the power of God, thuribles or censers, which usually connotate the incense, which is the prayers of the saints, instruments of music, which denotes their felicity. And then we see that the, the apparel that the angels will wear also has a lot of meaning. And so there's the apparel that they wear or the borders of their robes are jeweled. Like some of them will have sapphire, which is representative celestial contemplation. Rubies is representative of divine love. Crystals represent purity. And emeralds are for unfading youth. And the archangels are the principal or chief angels and are extraordinary ambassadors among the name of Gabriel, who is the angel of the Annunciation, the head of the entire celestial hierarchy, and denotes the power of God, Michael, who is like God. That's St. Michael, 
one of the archangels. And then there's St. Raphael, the healing of God. Uriel is the fire of God. So see how they all have a different function? Mm -hmm. They even have like a different essence, a different element, you know, to them, the way that they function. And so angel is the name, not an order of beings, but of an office. And it means messenger. So angels are represented as young to show their continued strength and winged to show their unweariedness without sandals, for they do not belong to the earth, and girt to show their readiness to go forth and execute the will of God. And their garments are often either white to denote purity or golden to show their sanctity and glory. Of course, we're still in, you know, the Dionysian documents here. And I just wanted to say that I personally have seen many angels who don't appear young. I've seen many who appear very, very old. And to me, it seems that the purpose of appearing old is to show wisdom. And so they, to me, they appear old for that purpose as well. And so now we're going to go more into these divisions and a little bit more about what they each do. So here we're in the highest triad and we're talking about the seraphim and the seraphim are described by Isaiah. And he says, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And in Revelation, round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind, and the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast was like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. It will be noticed that these descriptions differ from that of Ezekiel, not only in the number of wings, but also in the individuality of each beast being separate and independent, not compounded of the four. And so the seraphim are near the throne of God. And the cherubim are winged creatures, but the form of them does not resemble that of any living creature seen by man. God sitteth between the cherubim. Pujan's glossary of ecclesiastical ornament and costume says, the cherubim are frequently represented of a bright red color to set forth the intensity of divine love and usually standing upon wheels in reference to the vision of the prophet Ezekiel. And I just have to, I have to jump in here with my own experiences. I just have yeah, to. Yeah, no, please you do. Know, this is Dionysius. You know, so like for me, the seraphim to me are these beautiful, huge majestic angels near the throne of god and the cherubim are the baby angels and they're the little baby angels that you see statues and pictures of everywhere and with the wings and the thing about the cherubim that i'd point out is that people might think of them as just adorable and cute and whatever but when you actually come upon the cherubim it is a truly, purely precious, but powerful experience. They may be cuddly and cute, but there is something you, you know that you have been graced in a very beautiful, profound way. And you just are so del delighted. I don't use that word. I don't like the word, but it, you really are. You're just like, gosh oh my gosh you know there's a delight in it mm -hmm. you know it's it's rare but they're not just cute they are adorable but there's 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 something very powerful about them too and so this is interesting from the dionysian 
the description from Dionysius being so different. And it's interesting too, because in the art that has been done of the cherubim, it's also very different. But again, we're back here to Dionysius. So then we go to the thrones. This is Daniel's four view of the judgment seat of Christ. While the thrones were placed ready for those who should be found worthy to occupy them, they were not, they were as yet unoccupied. Their occupancy awaited the outcome of the judgment. Now, as the thrones that John saw were occupied by crowned elders, then those elders must have passed the fiery test of the judgment of the reward and received their crowns. These crowns are five in number. The incorruptible crown, the crown of life, the crown of glory, the crown of righteousness, and the crown of rejoicing. These all have references, if you look at the notes, in scripture. So the incorruptible crown is from 1 Corinthians 9, 25 to 27. The crown of life is from Revelations 2, 10. The crown of glory is from 1 Peter 5, 2 to 4. The crown of righteousness is from 2 Timothy 4 to 8, 4, 8. And then the crown of rejoicing is 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20. And so the thrones are these thrones where the crowned elders are. And then we have the middle triad, starting with the dominations. Dionysius says that the dominations are above all subjection. The dominations are reckoned among the ministering angels, not as exercising but as disposing and commanding what is to be done by others. Thus, an architect does not put his hands to the production of his art, but only disposes and orders what others are to do. So the dominations are overseeing. And then you have the virtues. And the virtues are temperance, fortitude, prudence, and justice. And when you actually go into the mystical spheres, you're going to see that there are many more virtues represented by angelic beings as well. I included, because I wanted to, something that's in the book called The Salutation of the Virtues by St. Francis of Assisi, because it's just really cool. Mm -hmm. So he said, Hail, Queen Wisdom, may the Lord save thee with thy sister, holy, pure simplicity. O lady, holy poverty, may the Lord save thee with thy sister, holy humility. O lady, holy charity, may the Lord save thee with thy sister, holy obedience. O ye all most holy virtues, may the Lord from whom you proceed and come save you. There is absolutely no man in the whole world who can possess one among you unless he first die. He who possesses one and does not offend the others possesses all and he who offends one possesses none and offends all and every one of them confounds vices and sins holy wisdom confounds satan and all his wickednesses pure holy simplicity confounds all the wisdom of this world and the wisdom of the flesh holy poverty confounds cupidity and avarice and the cares of the world Holy humility confounds pride in all the men of this world and all things that are in this world. Holy charity confounds all diabolical and fleshly temptations and all fleshly fears. Holy obedience confounds all bodily and fleshly desires and keeps the body mortified to the obedience of the spirit and to the obedience of one's brother and makes a man subject to all the men of this world, and not to men alone, but also to all beasts and wild animals, so that they may do with him whatsoever they will, insofar as it may be granted to them from above by the Lord. And that's from the writings of St. Francis of Assisi by Pascal Robinson. And so this is, you know, another thing I'd like to bring up here, mm -hmm. is the play of the virtues done by St. Hildegard of Bingen. And ironically, 
you know, St. Hildegard of Bingen is also one of the few women doctors of the Catholic Church recently brought in by Pope Benedict XVI. And she was in the 1200s, I believe, somewhere around thereabouts. And she wrote the very first opera. A Catholic saint wrote the very first opera. It's called the Ordo Virtutum, or the Play of the Virtues. And it's this really fascinating play. There's a, I have a DVD of it. I love this, this production, but you can find, you can find this done by various opera companies on YouTube. You just look for Ordo Virtutum or St. Hildegard von Bingen, and you might find it. What happens is there's a soul who is trying to find, and this is, you know, going back to the question of why is this important to know? St. Hildegard showed this so beautifully in the Ordo Virtutum. She shows a soul who is standing in the middle between Satan below and all the demons trying to drag her into her vices and her lusts and her sins and the beautiful virtues in heaven. And the virtues are up there and they're singing, you know, the beautiful, they have all of them and they have probably eight or 10 of the virtues singing. And they have a gentleman playing the role of Satan who's trying to tempt her back to her earthly ways, but she's working her way to let go of the old temptations and she finds her way into the circle of the holy virtues of the angels. And they bring her in. They're constantly calling to her and pulling for her and trying to help her up and help her to move higher and away from that temptation. And she eventually makes it. But it's beautiful. I highly recommend it for somebody to watch in, if they want to understand this play of our own struggle. It's the first opera that was ever written. And it's a Catholic doctor of the church, a Catholic saint, Catholic mystic, you know, pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And so then we move on to the powers and the explanations of the sacredly depicted likenesses represent the same ranks of the heavenly beings as sometimes ruling and at other times as being ruled. So Dionysius says, But if we say that the same rule and are ruled, but no longer the self-same or from the self-same, but that each same is ruled by those before and rules those below, one might say appropriately that the divinely pictured presentations in the oracles may sometimes attribute properly and truly the very same both to first and middle and last power. Now the straining elevation to things above and their being drawn unswervingly around each other as being guardians of their own proper powers and that they participate in the providential faculty to provide for those below below them by mutual communication befit truly all the heavenly beings, although some preeminently and holy, as we have often said, and others partially and subordinately. And then we go into the lowest triad. So with these triads, the highest, middle, and lowest, with consciousness of this, we sort, we know, know where we are. Yeah. It helps us to understand what and who we're dealing with, what and who we need to be dealing with, and where we actually are in terms of which sphere am I actually, where have I... Uh, come to here and can we communicate with these different triads from this physical realm like say prayers to we can say prayers to the angels and ask for their assistance and then when you're having an out-of-body experience if you're taken into some of these higher spheres you absolutely can communicate them to them and in particular in those experiences but those things are more not you know not something you can control or predict but in your prayers you absolutely can pray to the holy angels 